Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Aspetta che tolgo... Boh, ascolto un attimo. So I think uh, we can perhaps start. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, again, morning in Italy. So here it is nine o'clock. So I wish you all a good evening or a good night, wherever, whatever time it is at your place. So um, we start uh, the third and last day of uh, this online workshop. And uh, it is our pleasure to start uh, with uh, Andrea Marini. I guess many of you already know Andrea Marini. From, he's from uh, the National Research Council, the Italian National Research Council in Rome. And uh, he is one of the key players and key persons behind the YAMBO code, which is a code for calculating um, electronic excitations and all kinds of other things, typically with the many in the framework of many body perturbation theory. And uh, so today, Andrea will give us a talk about uh, palm-driven coherence, evidence of an excitonic insulator transition or a normal charge migration effect. So he will probably answer the question uh, in his talk. Please, Andrea, it's your floor. Hello, everybody. So it's really a pleasure to see all these people and, and actually to talk to have the chance to talk to all these people in general. It's not possible if we were having the conference, their interest, of course, we wouldn't have so many people attending. So let me share my screen. Yes. And then here we are. So, um, so it, what I would like to talk today is about a not very pedagogical, I mean, uh, uh, object and subject. And actually, I was thinking that maybe it's not very suitable for such a huge um, number of, of attendees, but still it's something that I would try to convey you, a message I would try to convey you, even about, about people that have no started any, any research in this ultra-fast phenomena. It is about, about a very key and elemental concept uh, that is uh, appearing naturally when you excite the system in a controlled way, the concept of coherence. But first, this is the picture from the last travel I did. It was uh, indeed in Adriatico, CTP, so the Yambo uh, school in January. And uh, really, I hope to come back to Rias as soon as possible. So, um, uh, Andrea, can you perhaps put your thing on full screen? Because otherwise, we see. You see what? Oh, yeah. Oh, it is full screen. You don't see full screen? No. We see the whole uh, PowerPoint window. Oh, that's that's a problem. Well, let me, let me uh, stop video. Try now. Is it better now? No, no. We see kind of the two the two black lines on the right. On the right. You see right. on the left all your slides on the right. Properties landscape for free. Yeah. It's as if you had not started the presentation. Oh. Um, Strange. When we tried it out five minutes ago, it was all perfect. <laughs> Can you can you can you see it or it's completely impossible to see the presentation? No, we one, one can see it, no problem. It's just that it's not in presentation mode. Oh, I see. In my case, it is perfectly in presentation. I don't know why. Uh, oh, oof. Do you have two screens or so? No, no, I have one screen. Wait, I let me let me do another way. Okay, I, I try with PDF. So maybe PDF is the, the problem is that I'm using Office. Ah, we even tried. Fabi, you tried two minutes ago. No? <laughs> what is different now? Okay, give me a second. Sorry. Screen. screen. Is it better now? Yes, now we can see only this. Yes. Okay, lovely, lovely. It's okay. Sorry, sorry for this for this small problem. No okay. problem. <clears throat> okay, so um, I was uh, talking about coherence. So what is coherence? I mean, if you take whatever book about coherence, in, especially in the in the field of optics, you see that coherence is just the way the, uh, the, 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 the system is uh, transferring information in a lossless way. So the most uh, simple example of a coherent 
object is a um, oscillating uh, laser, an oscillating laser, monochromatic laser with a phase that is not changing in time is perfectly coherent. So this means actually that the informations that are uh, carried by this, uh, uh, this signal, it's constant in time, it's just perfect. So when you are at whatever uh, time ahead, you can, you can uh, understand which kind of informations you have from the time that is behind. I mean, this is just a co perfectly correlated uh, dynamics. So now, um, in general, coherence is connected to a macroscopic observable. So when you actually, uh, in the real world, produce something that can be uh, a pointer or actually a movement, you have to act coherently. If you don't act coherently, you get confusion and, and you can, you're not able to sustain this process for a long time. However, if you look from a microscopical point of view, whenever you try to transfer coherence or to induce coherence in a material, all kinds of phenomena inside the material will tend to destroy this coherence. So this is pretty known, for example, when you uh, think in terms of polarization. If you excite a material, this material will start oscillating, the electrons will start oscillating, even the atoms will start oscillating. These oscillations will induce a macroscopic field that can be an induced field or whatever. But in general, even experimentalists know very well that this induced property will decay in, will decay in time. And the decay is due to the interaction of the coherent object with the electrons, with the phonons, with the atoms, with impurities, whatever. So the point is, how can you uh, produce coherence in a system? Or if you want, macroscopically, what is the engine that produces coherence and what is the concept of this coherence? So first, let's have a look at examples of coherent states at equilibrium. So let's forget about the excitation. So we take a system, a steady, steady system, and then we wonder under what conditions this system can express coherence. So one example is polarons. So if you take an Hamiltonian of, of this form, linear in the displacement, so C is the creation operator of an electron. This is the standard for all H. Holstein Hamiltonian then you have uh, the interaction between the electrons and the uh, uh, phonons or bosons in general, not only phonons, but you can think of phonons, with a certain in interaction, G. Then what is the ground state of an Hamiltonian like this? Well, you can think in terms of perturbation theory. So you produce one a state where in the vacuum you create one phonon, two phonons, and so on and so forth. And then you can solve this problem in the space with one phonon, two phonons, so on and so forth. But then you realize that whatever is the order, the number of phonons you create in the vacuum, the average of the displacement, and the displacement is B plus B dagger, this is the standard quantum harmonic oscillators, is zero. No way. Whatever is the order of phonons you create in the ground state, the average is always zero. But if for some reason this interaction is so strong that you need to consider all kind of phonons or more mathematically, you move in a ground state where you have an infinite number of phonons. So you see here you have a sum over all possible number of phonons with, the, with this sum not upper limited. Well, in this case, this state is named a coherent state and the displacement on this state will be non-zero. So you have a strong polar and you have a set, eventually a subtractive state. I mean, this state is able to induce a displacement onto the atom, so atom will displace. This has been also observed in equilibrium for system where this interaction is so strong, if you do, Arpes and the result for the emission spectra, you can see side bands of the electronic levels due to phonons. So in this case, you realize that a system that is not excited, not perturbed, to create a coherence has to do a non-trivial process, something that cannot even be treated within perturbation theory. So let's take another example. The excitonic insulator. 
now in the, in the original slides there, there were an animation so here everything is appearing at the same time but uh, follow my my what i tell you so first let's consider the system in a semiconductive system with a gap or a metal eventually but in the case of the semiconductor with a gap you can produce accidents the accidents are just a bound electron over pair with a certain binding energy if the binding energy is larger than the gap then it has been proved by many people on the earth that the system is unstable against the spontaneous formation of accidents what does it mean if you consider the your your, your very simple picture of a solid you imagine this fermi fermi c of electrons below fermi level and an empty completely above this is i mean the most easy picture you can imagine and this is at the basis of, of the normal uh, fermi system but if an electron pair in this system as an energy such that being bound produces a ground state with lower energy then that's it instead of this picture you have to adopt another picture where in the ground state there are accidents and this system is an accidonic insulator because there's a gap you see there is a gap and also the bond structure gets deformed what is important is that this system semiconductive or metallic where there are no accidents in the ground state as no polarization is normal right so i mean if you take a piece of wood this has no induced field unless you don't excite it the average of the polarization operator in the material is zero but if the system manages to make a transition to a ground state with accidents then as a net consequence you have a finite polarization and then you will understand that the polarization in this case is exactly the corresponding of the displacement in the polaronic case so when you go to an infinite number of phonons you have a finite displacement where you go to an infinite number of accidents in the ground state you have a finite polarization mathematically mathematically in the case of the uh, accidental insulator actually you realize that uh, some theories are common a little bit uh, you find those theories a little bit everywhere so uh, an example is a uh, superconductivity so you can actually uh, drive a connection between the polaronic theory and the bcs and also between the accidental insulator theory and the bcs because in both cases you have the creation of a state that would be not allowed in the normal state but that because of the strong interaction electronal interaction or electron phone interaction is well uh, motivated actually uh, allowed in the in the in the system so in the case of bcs you have the bonding of two electrons in the case of the external insulator you have the bonding of an electron in the hole the BCS state is written in this way. So you have that in the ground state, you have an infinite number of pairs of electrons created, mostly at the Fermi level. In the external insulator, the state, the BCS like, you replace one electron with a hole, but the form is exactly the same. So in this case, you are just saying that when you create a hole here, V, and then you need an electron here those two bodies will be bound and will produce an infinite number of objects in this uh, product what is important is that you can define an order parameter that is the polarization so this operator is the polarization and is it finite in the exidonic insulating phase this system does not behave as a Fermi liquid because as I told you before, right? I mean, in a Fermi liquid, you don't expect to have those excitations with a lower energy than the ground state, the Fermi ground state. So the occupations of this state in the conduction in the valence, that is VK and UK, has this non-Fermi liquid behavior because in the Fermi liquid, you should, have, you should have a gap here at the Fermi level. You should have, a, a, sorry, a, sorry, a step, a constant thing. Here should be flat while stopping. Lovely. 
how do you see so in the case of our in the case of the polaron you see the polarons as side bands in the arpes and again the arpes is the tool used to see the exidonic insulator phase that appears in two different regimes the bcs regime and the back regime so within an exidonic insulator you can realize by driving in this case of this material of net, this natcom the temperature or the interaction in the original uh, uh, picture of Keldish and Rice and, and Kozel, you can drive the, the, the system to move from an high density BCM regime to a low density back regime. Back means Bose Einstein condensation. So in the back regime, there are only few accidents and they condense. What you see experimentally is the uh, form of the band structure. So in the BC regime, you see this valley like, and this has been observed in 2014, while in the back regime, you just see a replica with the same uh, curvature, a little bit flat. So this is has been observed. Now, up to now, we were in the equilibrium. So I hope I convinced you that while at the equilibrium, not while, that at the equilibrium systems to express, to create coherence has to work hard. So either they have, they have to have a very strong electronal interaction, very strong electron phone interaction, and in general, they have to break the Fermi liquid uh, behavior that is the most used in, in, uh, in, uh, in physics. I mean, the, the thing that we mostly use when we do calculations. Now, let's go out of equilibrium. Can we drive coherence out of equilibrium? Um, well, Andrea, so sorry for interrupting you, but there's just one question, a uh, quick question. Someone would like you to say a bit more about the difference between BEC and BCS. B BEC, BCS? Yes, on the previous slide, yes. What, for, for what concerns us, I mean, of course, this would require a top itself. So for what concerns us, you may think that in the BCS regime, you have many of those objects that in general are boson-like objects. They are all together and they tend to interact all together. While in the back regime, this, uh, this, this family, this population of elementary bosons are diluted and they actually tend to concentrate on the Q equals zero uh, uh, occupation. So they tend to have zero uh, momentum. So the formal definition of a back is where having a certain family of bosons, you see an accumulation of the population of the gamma point. And this is what happens in the back, because in any case, you have all these accidents. If they're interacting together, they, of course, have no uh, a peaked uh, population at the gamma, but they are very diluted. They tend to relax towards the gamma point. So you formally, you distinguish between the two regimes from the occupations of the gamma point and also from the size of the accident. When the accident gets a shorter size, so it is more dilute, less interacting, you enter in the back regime. So, so and, and someone else then gives the follow-up question, if this means that the back is not a coherent state. In this sense, in the sense of uh, I'm talking here, it is a coherent state in the sense that it is produced by the coherent formation of an exidonic insulator. So it's coherent in the sense that the order parameter is different from zero. This is the sense of coherence in the present talk. Okay. Let's move on. Let's move yeah, on. Yeah, let's move on. Yeah. yeah, sure, sure, sure. I, um, so let's move on because now we go in the interesting point. So assuming that there is a very rich physics in speci specific and special conditions at equilibrium, what happens when we move out of equilibrium? When we move out of equilibrium, we know because it has been said at the very beginning that the easiest way to transfer coherence or to, I mean, apply coherence to much is to use a laser. If I use a monochromatic laser, I transfer coherence to my system. So let's go out of equilibrium. If we go out of equilibrium and we have in this uh, picture sort of um, summary of the of the different regimes. So here is time flowing. This uh, 
oscillating black curve is the pump. So the pump means is the laser strong enough to go beyond linear response applied by the experimentalists. In general, those uh, lasers are, are very short of the order of 50, 20 femtoseconds in solids. In molecules can be of the order of attoseconds, so much shorter. In general, after you apply this pump, you have the emergence of a polarization. So the electrons start oscillating as a consequence of application of the laser. This polarization is killed by the correlations on a time that is much longer than the laser, but depends on the system. But in general, I'm talking about solids. In general, it's of the order of 100 femtosecond. At the same time, you have an excitation of electrons. Those electrons are pumped in the valence and they decay on a much longer time scale because of the recombination, of the optical recombination. So emission of light. The coherent regime is the regime within there is a finite polarization. So by uh, people, this is, was pretty known originally from, from Kubo, but in the real time regime, it has been proved again and many times in those two papers that they discuss in this paper, that if you consider the polarization and you Fourier transform it, you get, because of Kubo, because of linear response, you get the uh, absorption. So in the case, sorry, there is an important point. In the case where this field is weak enough to be within linear response, it can be what arbitrarily strong, but if it is tiny, the current regime depolarization will, uh, will be equivalent to the absorption. So it is it's oscillating at the peaks of the absorption. So if you are including properly correlations, depolarization will oscillate at the excedonic frequency. So when you do Fourier transform, you get the excedent. So this is an easy way. You see that in the, in the, in the pump and probe, when you excite, you easily access excedents. I mean, by default, when you shine light, a coherent light, you produce a polarization, a polarization oscillating with excedonic frequency. And now, I, the question I would like to answer in the first part of the talk is, those accidents are of any way connected to the excedonic insulator. So how do they behave physically? And how coherence emerges in the excedonic dynamics in this coherent regime? Oh, last very short thing is that coherence also in the phonon case has been recently uh, proposed to be the, um, the driving force for some macroscopic uh, process like photosynthesis. So this is a very famous paper. I mean, I think Erling Tiaro went also on the press for this paper. Okay, and this is our, let, let, let me move a little bit further. So now, so the, the question we want to answer is, we excite the material and we excite resonantly with the accident. And then we create a certain population of electrons and the holes. We know that the polarization will, will oscillate at the axion frequency and we are asking those, those accidents that I observe in the coherent regime, do they condense? And then if they condense, is the condensation related to a BCS like wind function? And how do I see it? Uh, experimentally. So can I propose to the experimentalists to see eventually this object? To answer this question, we used a model because to do it ab initio, it would be uh, with the full corner sham and many body would be too cumbersome. So we used a model, but a model with a specific property. So we consider two bands. Uh, so this, uh, this is the free part, part of the Newtonian. You have two bands where CK and BK, so there is a missing part. So there is the energy for the conduction for the balance. And then there is an interaction. The interaction is a columbic interaction that is made in such a way on a piece of paper to not have polarization. So this interaction cannot produce bubbles and not producing bubbles cannot produce polarization. And then we, oh, sorry, yes, the conduction and the balance free part of the Hamiltonian, and then the interaction. So within this Hamiltonian, it can be proved the artifact is exact 
because there are no polarizations. So you can like, you cannot have correlation beyond R3 fold. So why this model? Because this model in the ground state has no polarization. So if you cal calculate the macroscopic polarization, that is, you see the same thing because it's the order parameter in this Newtonian, you see this is zero. So this uh, pair average is zero. So now we apply, we apply a laser. So we start from a ground state where there are no electrons in the conduction and the polarization is zero. We apply a laser and we observe that this is the electric field. There is a finite population in the conduction and a finite, uh, finite, finite occupation in the conduction and finite polarization. This polarization oscillates with a frequency that is of the order of excitonic energy can be a little bit different because of nonlinear effects. But now we wonder, the state driven by this interaction, is it similar or not to an exidonic insulator state? To answer this question, we use an equivalent, another Hamiltonian that we will show in a second to be equivalent to our original Hamiltonian. We replace the pump field with, the, we replace the pump field with a change in the chemical potential. So we just move the chemical potential in such a way to make more favorable the creation of a finite order parameter. And indeed, this Hamiltonian is made in such a way that by changing the chemical potential, you can induce an external insulating phase. So by changing, by reducing, you can think in simple terms that you are actually reducing the distance between the conduction and the valence and this reduction of the distance can, above a certain critical value, make favorable the creation of bound electron row pairs. So you have this spontaneous creation of a finite polarization. Now we wonder, how is this uh, Hamiltonian where we know there is an exonic insulated phase equivalent to the one for the excited? We use this model because it can be solved exactly. So you can prove on a piece of paper that the ground state of this Hamiltonian is this state psi m that has a BCF4. What is most important is that the order parameter of this Hamiltonian oscillates monochromatically with a frequency that is equal to the difference of the chemical potential. But this oscillation is exactly this one. It can be connected one to one to these oscillations when the frequency is matched to this uh, chemical potential difference. So the two Hamiltonians produce the same physics, but the Hamiltonian where we have manually changed the chemical potentials as a rich physics as can be demonstrated uh, numerically. So it has a complex phase uh, diagram where you have a normal insulating phase a normal metal phase and transitions are changing the chemical potential and the interaction to the exonic insulating phase. The transition between the insulating and the exonic insulating phase is indeed the back where we are, we are in the linear response. So we, are, we have a, a, a low density of accidents, linear response, beta superior equation. Then increasing the density, you cross again to a BCS regime correspond to those triangles. There is a transition between back and this here. But now, how do we see this experimentally? How can we say to the, to the, to the experimentalists to see uh, uh, experimentally? Well, it can be proved that uh, the Green's function of this uh, material is connected to the ARPES again. Now this is the terminus of ARPES in the sense that I first pump, I create this state in exon insulating like, and then I apply a, a, a probe pulse to measure the ARPES. And then indeed we predict the appearance of what? Let's see now. So by changing the interaction, we can uh, change the number of carriers pumped in the conduction. And then we realize that Experimentally, you should see at low excited density, this side band of the, uh, the valence, you see the side band of the valence and the carriers are here. We are in the back regime. 
then intermediate excited density. Again, more carriers you see here, this is a little bit flat and it is trying to change the concavity. And then you have an high excited density limit yet change of concavity with the BCS crossover. So experimentally, we are saying that. So the message of the first part is that experimentally, we are saying to the experiment, look, that if you excite coherently the material resonant with an exidonic frequency, then you produce an exidonic insulator in the coherent regime. This coherence appears as an exidonic insulated state and macroscopically appears as signatures, very clear signatures in the thymus of Arpus. Now, you may wonder, you have been using the word coherence, 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 coherence. But then there are two questions you didn't answer yet. The first is, how much does it take to, this, this state to be created? I mean, come on, you're talking about a very complex material and blah, blah, blah. While you are in the ground, a very complex phenomena, while in the ground state, the exidonic insulating phase appears naturally. The ground state is an equilibrium property, very fancy, but equilibrium property. When you shine the material with a laser, I mean, the coherence takes the time of the laser to be transferred to the, to the material. So is there any formation time? And then secondly, and actually I'm doing myself the question, I don't have the answer yet. When I have pumped up in the balance, my electron. And I'm saying that the oscillation depolarization corresponds to an external insulator. And depolarization has died. Is there sitting there yet an accident? So this is what is, has been discussed in the case of the quasi-particles and plasmons. So in, in the case of quasi-particle and plasmons, at least the creation time of uh, a quasi-particle has been observed uh, experimentally. So this was what this paper 2003 for uh, the uh, birth of a quasi-particle in time in time domain. And then also this is a very nice paper of Uber. I really invite you to read it because it's really nice, really instructive. And where you see the real time formation of a plasmon in a gallium arsenide. So now the question is, I would like to see it will be really tempting to see the formation time of this accident that we have been discussing. And Andrea, before you continue, there's one quick question. Um, the question is, would this happen in the case of any material with bound excitons? Uh, yes, yes. At least in the, in the, the, the model predicts that whenever you pump resonantly an accident, then you produce a state that is an exidonic insulating phase. Indeed, in the paper, in this paper, there is the calculation for lithium fluoride. That I mean, lithium fluoride is not a system that equilibrium as an exidonic insulating phase. Absolutely, no way. Even hexagonal BN. Uh, we are still understanding to what extent this state is stable. Because of course, if the accident you excite at resonance with, as a with, then this width corresponds to the lifetime, mostly, to the lifetime of the polarization. So within with that width, this special state will die. But the first question, I did, uh, okay. Oh, sorry, we, we are not, we are not standing there because why would I ask the guy, did I answer your question? Okay. <laughs> yes, I think so, yes. <laughs> okay, so, so the first question we need to answer now uh, to, to, to complete the picture is, is there any formation time? So quasi-particle, real particle, there is evidence experimental of the formation in time of the cloud around the, the particle. Plasmons we have, what about accidents? Oh, this will be great. I mean, this is something we're working at the moment because uh, this is really an exciting uh, uh, picture, right? Because I mean, we are really talking about an elemental physical property. So you take your God, you take, your electron, you remove it from the valence, you put in the conduction. You say, now there is time flowing. Tell me, how much time it, does it take to bind together? In the coherent regime I have just described, the formation is instantaneous. 
and those coherent accidents survive as long as coherence survives. But then people, and you see, those are only two papers of last year and, and 2020, where actually people is moving, is actually doing some, 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 some speculations in the incoherent regime. So Paris gestion has died. Do you have still accidents bound there sitting? So there are experimental papers that they uh, uh, declare to see this population and even fancy dynamics like mod transition of the photo excited pairs. But this is still under debate. It's still under debate because the field, I mean, the physics is not so easy, not so, so trivial. And I wanted to give you in the last part of the talk and a proof of that. So we have been discussing about the coherent regime, and now we want to go to the incoherent regime. And we want to consider this, exam, this, this experiment. This is an experiment by the Milan group of Giulio Cerullo, so Chiara Provatello, where they study transient transmission of a decogenite, MOS2, and from the rise time of the transient transmission, they did use the time formation time of accidents. We use extremely short optical pulses to non resonantly excite an electron or plasma and show the formation of two dimensional accident single area MS2. So, is it really true? Well, my point is that no, it's not true. And I want to prove it now. So, first, what is the material? So, I want to prove you now that, that it's not so, I mean, the, the, the exilonic, the coherent and exilonic exilonic phase is not a definitive answer. So we know that the system for the excited looks like a BCS back, whatever. So the equation to be solved are the same, but this doesn't imply that there is a population. And we say now, okay, MS2 is a decogenite, is this layer material. They are very fancy materials because they have strong spin orbit coupling. So you have the splitting of the bands. You have those valleys, K valleys that are at the corners of this hexagon. And each of these uh, ballet has different properties, so different pseudo spins. So you have valetronics and so on and so forth. So the absorption spectrum is well known. It is dominated by two bound and one continuous axiom, A, B, and C. In this paper, they, they are saying if I pump resonantly, sorry, sorry, if I pump this material with a tuning the frequency of the pump, then I see a formation time of the signal from A and B that I interpret as an external formation time. So I just hide all the complexity of this of the of the approach under the carpet, just say that in this case you need to introduce a spinorial many body perturbation theory that is even more complicated. And what is the experiment we are going to describe? Is a is an experiment where you have a pump on the sample and then a, a probe. And then you just instead of looking at the arpes as we did in the previous part of the talk, now we look at the uh, change in the transmission on reflectance, depends on how, 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 um, how, uh, how large, how, what is the depth of your sample, your thickness of the sample. If you thin, you can go through uh, uh, transmission. Instead, if it is thick, you have to use reflectance. So by looking at the change in absorbance, then you see that in general, you have derivative features like this. So this means that the probe sees a change in absorbance in the sense that this is shifted or more. Actually, a transient spectroscopy for them is, uh, is, is, is in this slide. And then uh, this has been done, for example, in 2016. And then depending on where the carriers go, you have Pauli blocking effect in the sense of reduction of the peak or the width of the peak of the absorbance, or you have a shift to lower energy when you have band gap normalization, or when the banding energy of the is reduced by the colors that you're pumping in the valence, you have in the conduction, you have this shift to higher energies. So this is just uh, the elemental processes in neutron transient spectroscopy. So now let's go again to the experiment. In the experiment, they calculate, they measure, sorry, they measure the transient transmission in the A and B. The probe is resonant to A and B, and the pump is, is uh, uh, with a frequency that varies between this arrow and this arrow. 
So changing the, the energy of the pump, they see that the rise time increases up to reaching a plateau when they pass through the optical gap. So they interpret this as the uh, formation time of an accident. So can we interpret alternatively? Okay, in this case, we have to use not a model, we do a realistic calculation. So applying non-equilibrium Green's function, and the equilibrium Green's function is a, is a way to write many body perturbation theory for non-equilibrium systems. So they are more complex if you do the fact that the time is not that good variable anymore. So this means actually that uh, the, the, there is no time uh, translation invariance anymore because you have the laser applied at certain time. So this breaks the invariance for time transition tr translations. So this means they have to go to a method where time is explicitly a real variable of the system. And this is the bind cadan of uh, equations. Here you have uh, BIM, uh, BIM is the is the core picture and cover of from the black and white. So you go on the Kaldish contour and then you do a lot of math. It's much more math than many body, but you can, after several manipulations, reduce the equation of motion for the lesser Green's function to the equation of motion for the density. So at the end, you just condense everything. You know, it's like if you're cooking something. So you you, you put on your table millions of ingredients. At the end, you get a plum cake. So simple plum cake. You don't see the ingredients anymore. This is neck for the end for dummies. So you put everything inside of this big pot, and then you, you mix, and you get this equation motion for the density matrix that is a co that has a coherent and collisional term. In the coherent term, there is the Hamiltonian describing the system at equilibrium. In this case, it is called a sham Hamiltonian. You have a field applied explicitly, and then a mean field part and a correlated part. So what is important, uh, besides the technicalities, is that this field is not assumed to be tiny. Within this approach that is not perturbative in the field, the field can be as strong as you like, no problem. Physically, the collision term is meant to describe different elemental processes. So uh, you have a process where an electron jumps to another state by emitting or absorbing a photon, or you have Auger-like processes where an electron decays to another state, giving the energy in another electron that is pumped up. This is Auger-like. And then you have rather the recombination. Everything con is connected to the lifetime, non-equilibrium lifetime introduced in the equation of motion for the density matrix. Then we have, okay, let me jump it. Let's go to the, let's go to the interpretation, alternative interpretation. So that is- Andrea, connected. sorry for interrupting you all the time, but since it is just to the very fitting to the, what you said, the question oh. is um, if the experiment can be repeated, for example, with a different pump energy and, and what would happen then? Absolutely. So the pump has been done with different pump energy. You see here, so those arrows are the different energy of the pump, pump photon energy. So in the experiment, they, they, they have a broadband prob, probe. With the probe, they, they, they probe this region here. And with the pump, they do several experiments for a certain time, pumping at these frequencies. Changing the frequency, they see a change in the rise time. You see, the colors of the arrows are the color of the curves, you see? Mm -hmm. So when you pump uh, near B, you have this fast rise up, fast. It's fast, you increase the pump energy and this gets slower, 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 unless you have, you have a, a, a flat signal. So you have saturation. Okay, thank you. I think it's very clear now, thank you. Okay, so. In the experiment, this has been explained as a formation time of accident. I give you a different interpretation based on numerical uh, calculations. The accidents in the A and B accidents in the MS2 are in the case space, they are localized in, at the corners of the hexagon, at the corners. So those regions actually define some. Uh, regions indeed in the billion zone that we name active accidental regions. These are the corners, you see the corners. Those active accidental regions are named in this way because whenever you touch those regions, the accidents will fill it. It's the, uh, if you want, it's a, 
is you can think about the accident as a person with the two feet just standing in the active regions. Of course, if you reduce, if you touch it, the accident will fill it because it, it is where it is putting its weight. Numerically, you realize that by changing the frequency of the pump, actually the electrons are pumped in different regions of the brilliant zone. So if, while in, you increase the pump frequency, the occupations move from a K-dominated, so it's not, they are mostly in the regions, to a situation when you pass the gap, where mostly they are in the outer part, so in the, in the actually main part of the brilliant zone not in the active regions, but in the main part of the brilliant zone. But those, the, the currents pumped into two regions, they migrate from one to the other because of the electron phonon scattering. So this migration con is connected to another point. When you excite here, not only the accident will fill it, but also the screen interaction will fill it because those uh, currents that are standing here, they have a very small momentum. The small momentum, is important because the column interaction, you know, by the I mean, the column interaction go, goes like one over Q square. So it weights a lot of the small momenta transitions. And the ones that are sitting here, they contribute enormously to the, to the screen, to the change in the screen interaction. So you see here that by changing the pump, you have a reduction of the change in the gap induced by the change of the screening, just because the electrons are standing, mostly in the, uh, not in the, in the external, inactive external region. So there is a very simple physics connected to the geometry of the excitation and connected to the migration of the carriers from one part of the brilliant zone to another part of the brilliant zone. Then if you look at the final theoretical uh, calculation of the transit absorption, you have this, this is the theory. And you see that the theory predicts very well the experiment. You have an increase of the time, rise time for the A and B accident. And actually this time is an excellent agreement with the experiment. So you see the, the, the dashed lines of the experiment and the continuous line of the theory. So even if, and this is the map. So this is the experimental map. You have, here you have time and probe frequency given a pump frequency of 2.3. So again, the maps are in very good agreement between the theory and the experiment. So the message of this second part of the talk is actually <laughs> opposite to the first part of the talk. So I'm still in the coherent regime because I actually I'm, well, what I'm, what I'm defending the seconds in this case is the transition between coherent and incoherent. But I have that, even if I have proved that by resonantly exciting the bound axiom, you have the formation of this condensate, I'm actually proving that they do when you are off resonance and you are pumping actually far from A and B, you cannot connect any more unique in, in, a, in, a, in a clear way with the experiment. Yes, when you pump not resonantly and you see how, how wide they are, when you pump off resonantly, you cannot easily say that your signal is connected to the formation of an accident. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence. And actually, the experiment can be perfectly proved by using uh, carrier migration. So independent part, uh, uh, so independent, single particle picture. Okay, so let me go to the to to the to the to the answer to the question. So accident formation of carrier migration in the experiment, in this specific experiment that uses transient transmission, the answer is there is no evidence for a link between the transient transmission, rise time and the Stigani population. This is a general message. So while it is clear that if you look at the RFS and you see states that are in a forbidden region, you say, wow, those states are not predicted by independent particle theory, it must be something different. In the transmission, in the absorption, everything is messed up. I mean, there are the signal from the equilibrium accidents plus uh, signals due to the carriers to the eventual accidents. So, so it's not absolutely the, the, the observable to you. But from a physical point of view that is important to us to understand still, oh, sorry. 
Still, the, 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 there is an open question. So I just want to say Yambo by was there at the beginning. There is a t-shirt for, yes, for the developers. So we are even a t-shirt. Think of this, we are at the level of marketing. Uh, are you selling those t-shirts? Then I would have to forbid advertisement here for commercial. <laughs> well, this is a, there is no price. You have to put a certain number of, of lines in the code. These are I see. <laughs> but free, eh? but free. That's why there are only a few of these t-shirts because they're full of bugs. So I wanted just to, to conclude with, an, with a question because my talk is actually has a lot of answers but also a lot of questions. Because at the end of the story, what I have convinced you in the first part of the talk, and this is true, I mean, absolutely, I'm not, I'm saying this is absolutely true. When you apply a, when you apply a laser or a magnetic field, you are transmitting to the material coherence. So you are taking at something that is really confused, you are trying to get in a straight thing. Ah, that's great. So you apply a magnetic field, you see a microscopic magnetization, microscopic polarization, atomic coherent displacements, that in molecules that can be there are standing and standing and sustaining for picoseconds because uh, there is little dissipation. And then people now is trying to say, oh yes, but I have also, so those are, my, those are microscopic objects. Microscopically, I'm creating population of accidents, be accidents. I mean, yesterday you heard even three accidents and so on and so forth. You have to be careful because the theory is complicated and only in the coherent regime where the, co the external coherence is absolutely dominating the physics, you can have a simple interpretation in terms of a simple concept like back BCS, external insert, and so on and so forth. When you go beyond the coherent regime and the coherence is still in the material, but partially defaced, we don't have a clear understanding. And there is a, a, I, leave you, I leave you with an important aspect that as a tradition, you should be aware of. So in the case of polaritons, so when you have accidents that are uh, uh, dressed by photons, photons, there is a huge literature. There is a very large community of people working in polaritons because polaritons can be used to produce laser. You, you have a back of polaritons and this state produces a monochromatic, emits a monochromatic light. So you have uh, polaritons based amplification. In that, in that field, people have been working about condensation of accidents for years. And there is a very uh, uh, important uh, actor in this, in this field, this is uh, Combe's code. Actually, he's working with the, with, with the, I don't know if it is Asbam or, 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 the, or, the, or the daughter. So you see Combe's code and Combe's code in the paper. But she was this review program physics, uh, clearly writing that when you consider more than one accident together, you have to drop the poor bosonic approach. So you don't have poor bosons. There is no way. Accidents are not like phonons or, like, like phonons or plasmons or whatever. Accidents are really uh, uh, specific objects because they are composed of charged objects, electrons and holes, and there is no way to avoid this kind of dugans where you have one accident and another accident just talking each other because of the two composite uh, holes inside. So this is an exchange diagram that is really almost impossible to get rid of. And there are still many open questions how to describe a state of more than one accident. So in the incoherent regime where you may have populations, still we, still we have little understanding and the gap with the experiment is pretty large. And with this, I think, I think my the, the, the people that are co-working in this in, in this talk, so my my pe people in my group, so Davide, Fulvio, and Carlos in my postdocs, then Ducker in Luxembourg, and Leandro, you now is uh, in Spain, experimentalist Chiara and Giulio, and then Valerie that did most of the calculations of the second part of the talk, and Enrico that did most of the calculations for this part of the talk, and also Gianluca we are that we are collaborating with very actively, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, for a very nice talk. And I'm particularly impressed with how much uh, theory and experiment uh, fit together in these uh, very complicated things. So uh, this is really something which is nice and doesn't happen all too often. Okay, so um, we have had already quite a series of questions during the talk, but still there are some, some other open questions, which I might just read to you, Andrea, and then um, 
and we go on. So one of the questions is the following. I read it. Um, in the Bose-Einstein condensation, there are excitons due to the short-range interaction and the long-range interactions. This is not a coherent exciton. So if these excitons due to the many body, short-range and long-range interactions are comparable to the coherent exciton due to the light pump, then what we have might not be a coherent exciton. Hence, it is more important to compare the two sources of excitons. Can you say something more about it? Well, I, 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 we needed, I think, a blackboard together to discuss it, but let me try to, to understand. So he's talking about three things. One is the short range interaction, the long term interaction, and the, and the pump. So I understand. I think I, it's about the two different kinds of excitons, the, those due to the pumping and uh, the normal excitons, if you want, due to long and short range interaction. In this picture, I understand them. I'm, I perfectly understand them. But you have to consider a different perspective. So if, if I was talking about uh, um, a back that is uh, naturally um, appearing in a material, so there is a spontaneous creation of a back of accidents, then I would agree with you that a coherence would emerge as a consequence of an interaction. And then we should sit and discuss carefully about what is the source of coherence. I totally agree with you. But you have to take a different perspective. So what is impressing in this um, is this equivalence. I know that it's tricky because it's, there is math. But physically speaking, this system is the one you are talking about, where there is the interaction that is causing a, a, a spontaneous creation of polarization. In this case, it is a matter of the interaction driving this. And then you may wonder if in the back regime, this coherence, you can define coherence like in the BCS. I agree with you. But in this case, I'm just proving you that a much simple system where you have a pump creating depolarization, so no fancy, can be lithium fluoride. This system pumped can be mapped one to one to the very much uh, uh, interesting and non-trivial state of this Hamiltonian that shows the property you're talking about. There's a one-to-one -one equivalence. So you have to change the concept coherence. In this case, coherence is the one driven by the pump that the system expresses creating accidents. You see, it's completely different. So it's not accidents, it's also coherence, but it's the laser. It's not so just you know, uh, uh, expressing coherence. So it's the other way around. Okay. So then there's another question which has been around since a long time, and it is quite general about the formation of excitons in amorphous semiconductors where localized states are present in the mobility gap and might be in the Fermi level. Can you say something about that? Well, this is an equilibrium properties, yes. Um, I'm not very expert of the, of the material, but still, if you have states in the gap, so maybe it's talking about defect or, or states because of the- Well, about the amorphous systems, which have these pin states sometimes, no? Absolutely. So you, you can have absolutely axioms there, but this is in the standard absorption. So when you do the standard absorption, you calculate the standard absorption of any material, depending on the gap and on the strength of the interaction, in general, you have axionic effects. Those exidonic effects can be continuous or leading to creation of bound states. In general, when you have surfaces, so surface states or in gap states, the formation is particularly favorable. Okay. Uh, then there's another question. I read it to you. Um, I would like to come back to one of the last claims, namely that excitons are um, peculiar because they are formed of charged particles interacting with, with each other. Um, I tend to look to phonons as uh, very similar objects in the sense that you can have an ion charged and an equilibrium side left empty, which can be thought of as a whole. Do you agree with this analogy with excitons or not? No, I don't agree. Because uh, in, in the phonons are, are quantum of the displacement. They are intrinsically, uh, if you want, let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. So, I mean, I know that it's a mathematical answer, but it's very much clear. So you can define your boson to be a real boson if you can prove me 
that they obey commutation uh, rules, like pool bottom. If you prove me on a piece of paper that BB dagger commutator is equal delta blah blah blah, then I buy your theory as a boson. It's a for phonons, so you can prove it. You can prove it. It, it, it is intrinsic in the definition of, of phonons. They are pool bosons. For accidents, if you try to calculate the commutation of true accident formation operators, you don't get a normal boson commutation rule. You get some corrections. If those corrections are large, you cannot talk about pool bosons. So, and you get those corrections because when you try to do mathematically the commutator, you have to use the commutator of electrons and, and holes because those are the ones that you know respect the anti-commutation relations exactly. So, and then the follow-up question is, do excitons not anti-commutate or? No, they, they don't have a, a, a bosonic, pool bosonic anti-commutator. You're gonna prove on a piece of paper that any exciton has this, uh, uh, if you want, zero anti-commutator for different excitons. Okay, and no. then uh, one other question is, uh, with the equation of motion of the density matrix, you look at single particle dynamics. How is this connected or connectable to exciton dynamics? Because when you use this density matrix, you can calculate the polarization. Let me see if it is written somewhere. Yeah, I think it's written here. Yes, 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 yes. So the density matrix is actually the of diagonal matrix element, the of diagonal of diagonal elements of density matrix, uh, C dagger C, C, B, C, B, C, B. So that the diagonal is C, C of diagonally CB. If you calculate this thing in time, the average of this thing in time, so the, the average of the density matrix in time of diagonal gives polarization. The oscillation of the polarization is signature of accidents in the sense that, oh, sorry, where is it? The beginning, sorry, yes, it's here. So, you see, this polarization is oscillating. Oh, no, it was, uh, yes. This polarization is oscillating. If you do Fourier transform, you see the oscillations correspond to the peaks of the absorption. And one of those components is the excitant. So the excitant is in this oscillation produced by the density matrix. Okay, yes. Uh, then there is one very short question. Uh, why composite bosons are fewer free from interaction? I do not really understand the question, but do you understand? No, no, composite bosons are not free of interaction. Actually, the, the, the fact that they are composite is, is promoting interaction. So in this case, so if you think of an accident as, when, when you draw an accident, you can draw the electron and the hole, right? So the, the, do, do this example. Do the, I don't know your name, but do this example. You, you take your piece of paper and you draw two, two electrons. And then you, you consider the dynamics of those two electrons in use by the many body. You see that it will, will have scattering. They will scatter one with the other. So elemental process selects a battery fog. Then you take another piece of paper and you draw again those two electrons, but then together you draw two holes and then you bind the electron in the hole. So now you see immediately that the interaction between the two electrons is still there. The only reason to disappear is that the binding is so strong that the hole is, is preventing the electron to do anything, the being together. is a very solid family, if you want, <laughs> extremely solid. So, well, I mean, they try to, you know, they have a girlfriend and a boyfriend outside the family, but no, no, the family is strong. You don't have to interact with anything else. Okay. But this cannot be proved on a piece of paper. It depends on the specific uh, form of the accident. If you manage to give me a system where the family is so strong to avoid what would be perfectly possible uh, when the two electrons are alone, then you would have proved that the bosons are uh, complete. The two objects are really bosons, no interacting. But this cannot be proved. In general, you have those processes and the theory must be done in terms of composite objects, not pool objects. Okay, so there's one last question. Um, I read it to you. Uh, just a quasi basic question on how you distinguish pump and probe frequency. Is it due to only time delay or are there other things? Okay, in general, yes, it's time. I mean, numerically and theoretically, it's time delay. There are two different, when you're in this, 
in this equation, sorry. Yes, in this equation, you have this f of tau is the, the field. So in this case, it's one, but this can be the sum of two. So theoretically, I clearly know what is the pump and what is the probe. Experimentally also, because they have a very fine tuning of the delay. I don't know if you ever saw one of those uh, optical tables, but it's full of mirrors in such a way that they actually delay, they, they have one laser that then split it. They have a pump on one side and the probe on the other side. The probe is reflecting in that direction, such a way that does a path scattering on the mirrors to get a delay. So also experimentally, they know perfectly the difference between the, the, the pump and the, and, and the probe. They actually produce it. And theoretically also, you know perfectly because in the equation, they are just the sum of the two. Okay, thank you again very much. Let me clap for you in uh, the, on behalf of uh, all people who have been listening. Thank you very much, Andrea. And I remind everyone that uh, there will obviously also be a question and answer session where you can ask more complex questions yourself to Andrea. It will be this afternoon in uh, Italian time. So it will be in about seven hours. You have the chance to ask Andrea again. Okay, so thank you very much, Andrea. Thanks to you. Okay, so um, it is now time to switch gear and uh, talk about uh, a poster session. Now, obviously everyone knows what poster sessions are in a, in a usual conference, but in an online setting like we are now, it is a bit difficult to, to organize something which is exactly the same. So um, 